Hey folks, Malforan here with another Dev Diary for Grey Eminence. Uh, this week it is all about culture. So uh, this is Dev Diary 6. There's obviously been five before this. If you're new to the Dev Diaries in the game, I have covered the previous ones on the channel. There'll be a link to the playlist at the end of the video, but we're just going to get straight into it. So yeah, hello everyone and welcome to the sixth development diary for Grey Eminence. Uh, today we'll explore how culture works in the game as this is one of the primary demographic properties alongside religion, social class, age, and gender. Culture is inexorably uh, linked to a lot of other mechanics, including some systems we have not announced yet. Well, that's, so that's good. We've got some unannounced features, which is pretty obvious. We're only, we're only six dev diaries into the game, so cool that they're already teasing a little bit what's, uh, what's coming down the road. In real life, culture is an umbrella term for a variety of concepts that relate to a given group of people. In the vast majority of historical cases, culture wasn't codified or organized systematically, which makes it difficult to model in accurate discrete terms that can be applied universally. So I think this is talking about trying to make the game not too gamified, but also you've got to kind of gamify culture. Like culture doesn't work in real life in a systematic way that's super obvious to program into a video game. At the end of the day, we are going to be playing a video game and not real life. So there's some things that will have to be made into systems, which I know a lot of people don't like if it gets too far, like um, when Imperator Rome first launched, it had mana points for a lot of things. I think that was a step too far in the gamification of how things work. So it's good for them to kind of call out, look, culture obviously doesn't work in the way it's going to work in the game, but it's kind of the best we can do. We are making a game at the end of the day. We're not trying to recreate real life. Uh, that would be a much bigger game. So um, in Great Eminence, each culture is compromised of three attributes, heritage, language, and customs. These attributes are not static and will change over time, which is fantastic to hear, but you'll see how in a little while. And then they're just going to go through uh, the heritage, language, and customs. So we're going to read through that. It's a bit of a longer dev diary this week, so uh, hopefully you stick around. If you do, hit the like button if you've enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel. I cover strategy games. But uh, yeah, let's just get on with heritage. Uh, the first property we're going to look at is heritage. We define heritage as any event or circumstance in the culture's past that is permanent, recognizable impact. Remember, while Great Eminence starts in 1356, it will stretch for 600 years, so any source of heritage must be impactful enough to remain in the people's consciousness through the time period. So they're going to go into an example here of Portugal. I think it's quite a cool example, and it really is going to show us how this system is going to work and how it is different, I think, to most grand strategy games. Uh, we plan on attaching some high-level mechanics to heritage that will mostly serve to steer the culture in a historically appropriate direction. To give you an example, let's look at the heritage of Portugal. In 1356, the Portuguese will have two primary sources of heritage, Roman from their time as a province of the Roman Empire, and the Reconquista from their struggle to expel the Moors over the previous six centuries. So this is obviously 1356. This is before Portugal became a big colony and seafaring nation. Well, they probably did a little bit of that before, but that's probably what they're quite well known for now. So it's cool that it's going to start with Roman and Reconquista, and I imagine if you do become that colony building culture that probably adds on that will, that will maybe become your next heritage so uh, first let's discuss why we've chosen these two particular sources of heritage while the roman empire control over the land of portugal was almost a millennium in the past it had nevertheless left an indelible mark on the people who lived there notably introduced both vulgar latin which is the precursor to the Portuguese language, and Christianity. So obviously that is, especially in 1356, that's obviously a massive change that happened in the past that will affect them now. And the Reconquista, on the other hand, was freshly completed in Portuguese lands in 1356. Well, perfect timing. It would leave a deep religious fervor among the people and a strong deference to religious authorities for centuries to come. So that is a cool one. It obviously happened exactly pretty much when the game started. I don't know if that's coincidence. It did make a major change there. So that's going to be kind of shown in the game. And this is one where we might get some uh, some feedback on. Uh, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, in contrast, we felt that Visigothic legacy of the Portuguese wasn't strong enough to include as a source of heritage. While the structures of nobility and feudalism date to Portugal's Visigothic period, we couldn't find a strong enough cultural impact to the people to warrant such an inclusion. Of course, all these are subject to change. So these are obviously, they're still, I think, at least a year away from the game coming out. So none of this is set in stone. Maybe they'll get some feedback. Visigothic, I can kind of see what they're saying. They did get nobility and feudalism from Visigothic. Would they have just got that anyway from something else? Is it strong enough to be a defining cultural aspect? Which I think what they're saying is Roman and Reconquista, they were massive events that 
definitely changed the progress of Portugal. Whereas Visigothic obviously was a big part of it, but would it have changed enough for it to be one of the like two pillar culture heritages at the beginning of the game? I can kind of see it from both ways. I think it kind of works well this way, to be honest. I think otherwise you're getting it into a very messy, <laughs> messy period. You know, if you're trying to do England, like there's so many herit heritage things, how this system works that you could think of and they've got to cut it down a little bit. So um, we'll see if it changes before launch. As they say, they're open for feedback, so you never know. Uh, so what do the mechanics of these sources of heritage look like? One of the primary functions is that it influence the higher level behavior of characters that belong to cultures with that heritage. So there's a lot under here and the later ones about how these systems are going to try and guide um, people and nations, not in a super railroaded behavior, but in a way that might play out in a historical way, or as it will mention later, historically plausible directions. I think this looks like a good system. I know from playing EU4 and uh, Imperial Rome, I know they're both Paradox titles. It's such an almost Paradox title. Uh, I know I always have to come back to that as an example. It's probably a game you've all played as well, so it's quite a quite a good one to link to, I think. They have the mission trees, which I think railroad nations too much in a specific way. They basically, well, they don't force the AI, but they do really, the AI generally follows them or players follow them. And it does steer you in, in a historical historical way you know portugal's mission trees are all about colonizing and then you colonize africa and then you get the next mission tree which colonized a bit of india and if you play it to the mission tree which you don't have to but it gives such good rewards it's kind of silly not to you do kind of make it like an alt history which is kind of plausible as it would happen this system and the ones we'll talk about later i think are that system but in a lot more i don't know i don't know if holistic is the right word but it's a lot more it seems less railroaded but it will give you a similar outcome so again we'll see how it uh, how it works out there uh, for example we can encourage rulers or elites with roman heritage to assist other rulers when they're under attack by non-roman enemies with a greatly increased likelihood if the attacker is also non-christian or to engage in liberation wars if roman heritage cultures or already suffering under someone else's yoke. I think this is talking about like, say, Italy gets taken over by the Abbasids or someone like that, that the um, that any other Roman cultures that have that heritage will look at that and say, oh, we should liberate those Roman or those also Roman heritage cultures because we're kind of like brothers in arms kind of thing, kind of like an, a loose alliance without being an alliance. They're, they'll see Italy fall and then be like, hmm, I'm going to go and help them <laughs> and uh, and do that. In this way, we can nudge the game in a historically plausible direction. It should be difficult for Muslims to make a reverse reconquista or gain a foothold in Italy, whereas the Balkans will have no such cross-cultural solidarity to protect them. I mean, that's never backfired in history. Uh, speaking of the reconquista, heritage will also impact the behavior of populations. People with the, the reconquista heritage will be harder to convert away from Catholicism and will be more upset than usual when attempting secularization. So it looks like this affects both in the example of Portugal itself, but then any Portuguese speaking regions in the game. So if you, I imagine maybe if you go colonize and you colonize with Portuguese people and then that colony gets taken over by somebody else, it isn't going to just switch to that nation. They're going to stay as Portuguese for at least a while. And that might bring up maybe rebellions and things like that. So, um, yeah, interesting to see how this works out. It does sound good from from what we've seen so far. But uh, here, here's a nice little UI. Portuguese, Kingdom of Portugal, has a million Portuguese people in there. And then the heritage of the Portuguese is Roman and Reconquista. They've got a nice little icon for each one, which is pretty cool. So that's heritage. As, we see, as it says there, nothing is final. Uh, this is just an example. And then language is the next one. The second defining trait of every culture is its language. Unlike heritage, language is a trait that may very well change during the course of the game. To be fully clear, we're not going to simulate writing systems or grammatical changes, which is, you know, they can't simulate everything. Such a level of detail would be too difficult to implement if for the whole world and wouldn't add enough meaningful gameplay to justify the development costs. I agree with that. I know some of you may disagree and think the language is more important than that, but I think the trade-off is is just too small. They like to say the investment for it. It would be cool to have, but I don't. Think it's, I think that time is worth 
uh, invest in somebody else. As such, languages and grammars are static, although cultures can change the language they use. This sounds very like Crusader Kings 3. They just added languages. Sounds kind of like how it works there. Every language belongs to a specific language family. Going back to our Portuguese example, the Portuguese language is part of the Romance family, alongside many other languages like Castilian, Occitan, and Sardinian. Definitely butchered that middle one. Uh, languages within the same family have a similar, although much weaker, effect of providing cross-cultural solidarity. So yeah, just saying people within the same language family will probably have some kind of modifier because they speak the same language. The most tangible impact of languages is in the game is for character relations. Most characters know their native language and one or two others. Obviously this makes it difficult to build deep relationships with other characters that don't speak any language. They aren't fluent in. This is great. It is bringing that level of almost RPG to this. It does seem more of a grand strategy game rather than kind of grand strategy and RPG game, but talking about how language is going to affect relationships in the game, whether it's just a modifier. Hopefully it's not just a modifier. Hopefully it does make some other difference. Maybe you can get married, but then it kind of falls apart because you just can't speak to each other. Again, we'll see as the as we get more dev diaries. Yet it also opens up an interesting opportunity for player agency. Educate your heirs in the language of your enemies, and you'll find it a lot easier to engage in diplomacy with them or meddle in their affairs. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, it does sound like it's going to make quite a big impact, actually. It makes it a lot easier to engage in diplomacy. So what if you don't speak their language? I guess maybe you can't do peace with them, or it must be some kind of modifier, I imagine. I guess maybe a good example would be Mongols come in. They speak maybe a, a different language that no one else speaks. And obviously you can't, you can't have diplomacy with them because you can't speak their language. So you might be like, quick, son, I'm going to send you somewhere to learn uh, the Mongol language and then come back and then I'm going to send you to the Khan and make <laughs> make peace with him, please. And there we go, nice little UI. The language is spoken by the people in Portuguese culture is the Romance language and there's a million speakers. And we're on to customs. The final component of every culture is customs, which we define as a widespread activity or behavior that is practiced by members of the culture and that's meaningful consequences. And this is a very broad definition. So to be clear, we're only adding customs that will have some sort of impact on gameplay. We're leaving flavor customs to modders for now. So that's pretty cool. They've got the system in. They're only going to do customs that actually affect gameplay. Uh, they're leaving modders to make maybe just cool customs that don't affect the game, but will change the kind of gameplay a little bit or just some get, as it says, some flavor on the game. Unlike Heritage, a culture's customs can be changed over the course of the game. History is rife with examples of people and the behavior adapting circumstances. Very true. So we've designed customs to reflect that. Every custom has unique conditions that must be reached for a culture to adopt it and maintain for a culture to retain it over time. To illustrate how it works, we'll once again return to our Portuguese friends. So it sounds like these are almost, you do an event, you, you do something, and you fill up a bar, I guess. We'll we'll call it XP. You build up XP doing an event, doing a thing in the game, and then once you hit a certain point, you basically get a bunch of bonuses, and you're you're known for that. And I think that's what it's going to go into next. In 1356, the Portuguese culture starts with three different customs: winemaking. Oh, that that isn't one I expected. <laughs> Seafaring and wanderlust. No, wanderlust. I've never heard of Wanderlust, but let's go with it. These customs reflect behavioral patterns in Portugal that were either fully developed or in the process of developing at the time. Obviously, they're generalized and are not perfectly suited to exact historical circumstances in 1356, but alas, that is the price we must pay for our system systemic approach. Again, just saying, look, it's not going to be perfect, but we have to call the line somewhere, and, and this is the best approach that we think. So um, I kind of agree with them. But uh, we'll see what else we're going to go into now. For now, let's look at winemaking. Good. They picked the one I was like, what? what is that about? It has two population-wide effects. It increases the desire of Portuguese people to consume wine, of course, and slightly increases wine production by Portuguese wineries. Kind of like a reverse catch-22 there. We make more wines, we drink more wine. And if we want to drink more wine, we have to make more wine. Another impact is on character behavior, where wealthy Portuguese characters might try to start their own wineries, even if the economic conditions for that aren't ideal. I think this is the first time this has been mentioned. Maybe it was in a previous one, and I, I don't remember, but it sounds like on here that you will rule the nation and you can build things on the tiles, but it sounds like AI characters within your realm will also build things um, on tiles. It says here, wealthy Portuguese characters might try to start their own wineries. Maybe they're talking about in general, the AI. It'll be interesting to see in the future whether, whether they clarify that. You know, if you're playing as Portugal, does it mean like English characters will build castles or something? 
or does it mean within the Portuguese realm, the AI will build things even if you're in control, because that is historically what they kind of were building. So what makes a culture get into winemaking? Just good wine, I get grapes. Uh, well, the natural first requirement is for the majority of the culture's population to live in tiles suitable for growing grape vines. The second requirement is for the population to already be consuming a certain amount of wine, which might sound like a <laughs> chicken and egg problem, kind of like my reverse catch 22. But keep in mind that there are other ways to increase wine consumption. For example, many Christian denominations feature wine in their sacraments. So again, this is kind of linking the two things as well. This is saying if you're a Christian religion, you will naturally consume more wine just because of the sacraments, the religious events they do. So that will feed into probably your economy and then the economy will feed into your culture, kind of build that circle of growth for a nation so they don't just play out the same. The third requirement is for the culture to already have a certain amount of wineries per capita. Uh, that is quite good because it means it's not just going to happen. You can probably prevent this from happening as building up the skill and traditions of winemaking takes a lot of trial and error. It sure does. The Portuguese culture starts with a custom already adopted, but it can naturally emerge in any culture as long as they fulfill the conditions for enough years. And conversely, winemaking might be forgotten if they stop doing it so yeah you can be playing as i don't know sweden just build a bunch of wineries and you could be well known for swedish wine but if you stop making it you'll obviously gradually over the years over the centuries forget that you ever liked wine and then just go back to raiding people so um it's, it does sound like you can kind of tailor you can start as a nation and then kind of ease them in a certain direction over time which is which is cool and then obviously the ui winemaking seafaring Sailing the seas is an ambition for many people of this culture. They excel in maritime navigation, fishing, and shipbuilding. Uh, Wanderlust. People of this culture often embark in journeys of, and then it's cut off, probably on purpose there, <laughs> so we can't see. I, I, maybe that's talking about like colonialism, um, kind of matched with seafaring. They're like journeying out into the world to try to find out what's happening. So uh, yeah, the seafaring one's interesting. I think we talked about this in one of the earlier dev diaries. It does seem like what they were discussed above. I wonder if you're like a semi-landlocked -land nation, trying to think of one, Switzerland, and you end up expanding and having some coastal land. And then if you continuously build ships and explore the map and things like that, I wonder if you will basically learn seafaring and then <laughs> Switzerland will become known for being a seafaring nation over time through the use of that, which again, I'm pretty sure was in an earlier dev diary. And I really like this system in games. I think it's much better than say civilization where you just go, oh, we know shipbuilding now because I clicked a button and we, we, we build ships. Even if we don't have any coastal lands, well, I have to do shipbuilding to get something else. So yeah, we, we learned ships and, and we're off. I much prefer this way because it kind of plays out how historically it would happen. You know, if you're Switzerland, you're not gonna know about shipbuilding or seafaring, but if you're Portugal, you're definitely gonna because half your country is on the coast. So you're gonna naturally learn that thing and get better and better at it. And obviously over time, it helped them be uh, traders and colonize and uh, have a fleet and all that cool stuff. So it does look like that's the case. And also it's cool how it says you can forget them. So maybe if you're Portugal, you lose the coastal land, you move into maybe, you know, it's not likely to happen, but you ended up being surrounded in the center of Spain. Um, over time, you'd forget how to do shipbuilding, which again, is kind of historically correct. You would forget if you don't build ships, you know, after, after a hundred years, you're probably like, what are ships? <laughs> well, you wouldn't be what are ships, but you wouldn't know how to do it after centuries, probably after longer than a hundred years, um, after like a couple of centuries, you're going to forget how to do it. And you would learn, I don't know, mountainous things or something like that. So it'd be cool to see how it works out in the actual game itself. But I would think this looks fantastic. Again, let me know if you agree or disagree. And then Homeland, there's a couple more quick things here. Homeland, now that we've gone through the structures of cultures, we can take a look at some of its effects. In line with our systematic approach, we've assigned each culture a homeland, a country that all members of this culture recognize as their home. Homeland countries have a few notable benefits, and some we will not disclose yet. Little tease for a future dev diary. They're much more likely to attract immigrants of their culture and will always accept their culture for the purposes of discrimination and citizenship. They were covered in a previous one. In general, once the era of nationalism has arrived, homeland countries get a lot of advantages in stability. But again, that's a topic for another time. They're, they're really giving us those spoilers for future dev diaries this week. I quite like this system. I imagine it is talking about, say, um, yeah, again, we'll use the Portuguese example. If you do go colonize in America or, you know, South America, anywhere, basically, and um, 
over time, even if that colony maybe separates from you, they're still going to be Portuguese for at least a certain amount of time. And they will see, oh, the homeland is, is Portugal. That's where we came from historically. And they'll have a lot of ties. And it sounds like we get some cool benefits. Maybe they're better for like trading and opinion modifiers and things like that as well. So uh, again, that's a quite cool. I've not seen that in a game before. So that is an interesting system. Divergence, once the mechanics that make Grey Eminence cultural system dynamic is the ability for cultures to diverge on their own. This is an ir irreversible process that creates a new culture out of an existing one with somewhat different properties. There are a few requirements for divergence to happen. For example, the one culture must not reside in its homeland. So this is just saying how over time Time. If we use the thing I just talked about, Portugal goes and colonizes South America, they separate from Portugal, or even just are a colony, over time they will change. Um, yeah, so like a lot of uh, Central America was obviously Spanish people from Spain, and over time they kind of forgot their customs from Spain and gradually learnt new customs um learn things from the natives and things like that so it's kind of cool how they're going to show that in game if you're away from your homeland for a certain amount of time you will gradually forget and learn new things and kind of be that divergent version of portuguese so um yeah cool to see that in the game branches groups and supergroups this is the last section in the same way that we group languages into families we also group cultures into branches groups and supergroups these categories allow us to include cross-cultural mechanics similar to the Roman heritage we discovered previously and to provide AI countries with a rough geographic guides on which countries they should care more or less about. So I think this is talking roughly about, say, like Gothic, which is a group of people in Northern Europe, uh, Northeastern Europe, that kind of area. So it won't be like, there isn't a country called Gothic, but it will affect how countries within that area of that group act in the game so they're more likely to consolidate their lands within the gothic area rather than push off east or somewhere if you play crusader kings 3 you'll know this from say uh, the byzantines in that game they always head north or east and just pick on small nations that have nothing to do with them whereas it sounds like if it was this game they probably more obviously not every time but more likely to push west and maybe retake italy um retake kind of roman previous roman lands and things like that well, which is cool again ca not railroading but guiding things softly in a in a historical adjacent manner and uh, this is part of the system that formable countries so you'll learn more about that in a future dev diary so cool again it's given us a little uh dev diary knowledge there and the last section is mod ability as always don't really know about mods. Uh, this looks like they're doing a lot of mod stuff. So um, yeah, if you're interested in that, take a look at it. I'll leave a link to the dev diary in the video as always. And yeah, that's it for the dev diary this week. Next one is in two weeks on the 23rd of April. And uh, they're not going to say what it is. So we'll we'll find out on the day. Um, as always, if you've enjoyed it, hit that like button, subscribe, do all that YouTube stuff. And uh, let me know in the comments down below. Do you think this looks cool? Are there things you already think might not work? Um, it is a very big game by the looks of it. So we'll see how well they implement these features. But uh, yeah, that's going to be it for today. I'll see you in the next one.